Today's presentation is titled Radiation and Ethylene Oxide Sterilization for Medical Device Manufacturing. I'm Courtney Young, an attorney at Medmark's Loss Control Department. On behalf of Medmark and today's presenters, Mark Abel, Tim Patton, and Rod Parker, thank you for joining us. Mark is a se the Senior Program Manager for Non-Destructive Testing, Measurement, and Inspection, Electronics and Aerospace Quality Systems. He's also a PRI Staff Engineer for the Medicred Sterilization Task Group. He's got 39 years experience as an NDT professional and 20 years inspecting various components in aerospace, nuclear, construction, and fabrication industries. Kim has a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from Clemson University. She's, got a, she's the Worldwide Pro Sterilization Program Manager for BD Corporate Shared Services. She's also a Certified Lead Auditor for 13485-2003 and is Greenbelt Certified. Rod Parker has a Bachelor of Science in Medical Technology, Master of Science in Biomedical Engineering, and a Doctor in Business. He began his career as Interna International Research and Development Corporation as a Clinical Pathology Supervisor, and later with Miles Corporation as a Clinical Pathologist. Since joining Stryker, he's been the Manager in Regulatory Affairs and Clinical Sciences before assuming the role of Senior Principal Scientist with Stryker Instruments Division of Stryker Corporation with a focus on scientific assessments for sterilization and material compliance to U.S. and international standards. With that, I am pleased to turn things over to Mark, who will begin today's presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, our agenda, as you see in front of you, the uh, first thing is going to be what is MedicRed, and then MedicRed Sterilization Task Group, Audit Scope Sterilization, Industry Sterilization Recalls and Issues, critical technical process audits using subject matter experts, technical standards compliance, standardized accreditation, supply chain and OEM requirements, and then we'll talk about some non-conformances in the sterilization program. So the first thing, what is MediCred? Um, MediCred is an industry-managed approach to supplier quality oversight. And as Courtney said, uh, my name is Mark Abel. I work for Performance Review Institute. Uh, we run a well-known industry managed program called NADCAP. Uh, that's been since 1990. Uh, and um, this MediCred program is based on that. An industry managed program is one where all parties are basically involved in creating the program. That is, the uh, suppliers, OEMs, subscribers, uh, all are involved. Uh, this program provides a mechanism to identify the critical manufacturing processes used by the device industry and oversee the supply chain's ability to meet these requirements through a surveillance and accreditation process. So basically, we're going to be conducting audits and accrediting suppliers. This brings together technical experts from both industry and government to establish requirements for accreditation conduct in-depth audits by subject matter experts and accredit suppliers. So the keys are that this is a, these are technical experts. And again, this is not only the subscribers and OEMs, it's also suppliers, uh, government experts. Uh, the whole gather together to uh, develop the audit criteria and conduct these audits. And the audits are conducted by subject matter experts, which we'll go into a little bit more detail later. Um, and we will be accrediting suppliers to this process in sterilization. This, this whole process together results in standardized approach to critical manufacturing process quality assurance and a reduction in redundant auditing throughout the industry. So if you have multiple OEMs and subscribers um, under this umbrella, so they accept the audit that's being conducted, if you have 10 of those, then all 10 of those will accept this audit that's conducted, and so it reduces the amount of redundant auditing. So those 10 OEMs don't have to go out and do their own audit. It, it can be covered in this one audit. And like I said earlier, this is based on the success of the aerospace program, NADCAP. Currently, well, we conduct over 6,000 audits a year in the NADCAP program in 17 different areas. Uh, so we do, we do have lots of experience in, in industry-managed programs. So what is the MediCred scope? Again, it's an industry-managed audit and accreditation program that assures compliance to critical manufacturing processes and reduces the risk to patient safety. So if you can have 
if you can have an audit, an audit criteria that's conducted uh, that covers a large amount of very specific information, um, we're counting on this to reduce the risk to patient safety. MediCred is an audit tool for medical device OEMs to use to ensure appropriate oversight of their supplier base while maintaining ultimate responsibility for device quality and compliance. So the OEMs, while they retain responsibility for their supplier base, uh, MediCred can be a tool for them to participate in uh, and have their audits done that is a, a universal type audit where it covers many different OEM's requirements. MediCred program provides an in-depth, critical process focused technical audit conducted by industry recognized and approved subject matter experts to ensure conformance and compliance with accepted industry technical standards and OEM requirements. So again, this is an in-depth, critical, process-focused technical audit. It's not a um, shallow, if you will, um, a quality systems audit per se. Uh, it's a very in-depth, critical, technical audit. Uh, so it goes far beyond what you would get from just a, a very standard quality systems audit. Uh, we um, are very active in trying to find the best subject matter experts to conduct these audits. The task group, and it says approved, um, uh, because the task group is responsible for approving those audit auditors. So when we find an auditor candidate, they get interviewed and they get tested, and, and there's there's a whole big chain of events that goes on there to approve those those auditors. Uh, and it assesses the effectiveness of the supplier's quality management system at the critical process level. So. Uh, PCBAs, heat treatment, in our case, of course, sterilization, welding, uh, et cetera. So the second item on the agenda was the MediCred sterilization task group. Let's just take a, a quick look at what that looks like. Here's the task group structure of sterilization you see on the top. On down the left-hand side of this uh, has checklists. And the current ones we have right now are the quality systems. This covers uh, 13485 items. It also covers calibration and um, um, uh, individuals' radiation. There's our second one. Well, I'm sorry, that's uh, AC8113 is the number for that. Radiation is 8113-1, and that also includes gamma and E-beam. And then we have ethylene oxide, which is our 8113-2. The center has the task group members who makes that up. Currently, chair, our chairperson is Kim Patton, who is also on this call, would you be hearing from next. Our vice chairperson is Rod Parker, and he is also on the call, you'll be hearing from him too. Our secretary currently is vacant, and then the rest of the representatives, and this could be OEMs, subscribers, suppliers, um, whole a gamut of covering the entire industry uh, and industry experts. And then staff, like I said, we, I, I work for Performance Review Institute. We are the administrators of the program. This is an industry-managed program, so companies like Kim's and Rod's actually control what goes into the checklist. Uh, we are the administrators. Currently, I'm the staff engineer for the program, and then our coordinator, who actually does most of the hands-on work of um, getting the checklist changed and putting out the minutes and agendas, is our Jennifer Kornrumpf. And that would be the end of mine. I will uh, give this to uh, Kim Patton from Beck and Dickinson and Company. Okay, thank you, Mark. Hello, everyone, good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna start out looking at um, the audit checklist. And the checklists are critical to, to the audit and is completed throughout the process of the audit by the MediCred auditor. Um, so I'm gonna go through what's um, the headings in, in these checklists. And for the technical ones, I might point out throughout some of the questions on each checklist, just to give you a flavor of what, um, what they uh, include in them. First though, we're gonna look at the base checklist or the quality audit checklist. Uh, this is based out of, on 13485 and 21 CFR 820. Now the checklists are designed for either a yes or no answer. 
there are some questions that we'll have in NA as depending on the facility, the question may or may not be applicable. So having a yes or no answer provides a consistent uh, method of assessing the requirements stated in the standard and then it's up to the, uh, it's the responsibility of the qualified auditor in both quality systems and technical assessment of the sterilization modalities to make the determination as to whether or not the intent of the standard is being met in each of the questions. So first of all, the scope, um, this addresses the facility accreditation for Medicred and verify, to verify and document that the quality systems are in place. General information uh, it provides references and auditor instructions as well as supplier instructions. Information uh, is just information about the facility, the nature of the business, number of shifts, contact names. And then quality documents goes into your certifications, uh, inspections, reaccreditation audits, et cetera. Then the tour, uh, the tour should be a comprehensive uh, of the sterilization facility and goes into facility layout, appropriate receiving and shipping areas, and then designated areas for process versus non-process. Facility management covers pest control and, and in general environment. Quality management, management responsibility, this is your uh, quality manual, quality po policy, objectives, control of documents and records those things, and then resource management is training, uh, retraining, effectiveness of training. Production and process control, this is the planning of the process, um, the requirements, communication with customers, validation, uh, also includes purchasing, uh, control of product and services, and traceability. And then we have um, measurement analysis and improvement. Here's, um, this is where all your customer feedback or complaints, internal audits, monitoring and measuring process, analysis of data, corrective and preventive actions are all included in that section of the checklist. And then there's a section that goes into uh, risk assessment tools. If I can get it to move forward, there we go. Okay, so now the radiation audit uh, checklist. So we'll go through, and like I said, I'll throw out a couple of questions to give you an idea. Um, so this has an, a scope as well. This is the requirements for suppliers that are seeking accreditation in radiation. The general information basically lists references. And then you get into the IQ, and, and first we'll talk about gamma, the IQ section where you'll have questions such as, uh, is it conducted in accordance with recognized standards, uh, descriptions of containers that hold products, is that available, um, is there a description of available radiation pathies for processing, and then the OQ section will have things such as, was there a container qualification grid defined with a sufficient number of dosimeters to determine the dose distribution within the container? Uh, did the, uh, was homogeneous material used to generate the load for dose mapping? Uh, did this material bracket the extremes? Uh, were dose map uh, containers filled to their design limits? So those are just some of the many questions in the OQ section uh, of this checklist. The PQ section has a, a statement at the very beginning uh, that if the quality uh, technical agreement defines PQ as the customer's responsibility, then the section is NA. And there's a, a check there uh, that, that can be checked as, as not applicable. But some of the questions in this section uh, does the PQ protocol define, define the um, loading pattern? Is there like a rationale and strategy for the dose mapping? 
Um, is there a correlation provided between a reference dosimeter uh, to another location? And then um, we go on to IQ, OQ, and PQ for E-beam, which is, is very similar but uh, has different parameters that it's looking to, to uh, answer the questions for, such as scan frequency, scan horn size and orientation, beam spot size, energy. So these are definitely has some differences there in the, in the types of questions and things that the auditor is looking for in those specific to eBeam. So then we go down to uh, SOP's product process specifications. This is where all of your um, customer specification issues would be addressed. So again, I'm talking about uh, is there a product loading pattern? Are there any special instructions provided? Are minimum and maximum doses uh, defined as to what to be delivered? Um, routine monitoring dosimeter locations and frequencies should be defined. Um, are there uh, provisions for partial irradiation containers or any special handling? So then we move on to routine monitoring and control. Uh, do process controls include adjusting the cycle timer of the conveyor speed for source decay? Uh, have uncertainties in the dosimetry system been addressed and accounted for in setting cycle time? And then more on dosimetry systems. Uh, are there procedures with acceptance criteria for incoming inspection? Are dosimeters stored in an appropriate environment? Uh, does each batch of dosimeters have its own calibration curve? Is there a specialized, uh, specified frequency for recalibration? Okay. And then we'll go to the ethylene oxide uh, checklist and set up similarly to the radiation. Um, the scope is for the requirements for suppliers seeking Metacred accreditation in ethylene oxide. Uh, references under general information, under facility. Uh, one of the questions there is the sterilant stored per the vendor specification, the ethylene oxide. And are biological indicators and PCDs pre-sterilization storage conditions specified? And are those routinely monitored and recorded? Uh-oh, sorry about that. Um, let's see, then we move to EO sterilization validation. Is there um, an IQ or OQ for the sensors uh, used for temperature, weight, and humidity? Does PQ include a description of the product shipper loading pattern uh, with the sterilizer, including separation and spacing of product? Uh, under PCR preconditioning, uh, has the pattern of air circulation in the conditioner been characterized? Under sterilization, have a sufficient number and placement of temperature and humidity sensors been used to characterize the empty sterilization chamber? And then aeration, uh, per the ISO standard, have a sufficient number of temperature and humidity sensors been used characterize the aeration chamber. And finally, process controls are all parameters uh, defined and accounted for in the process control uh, specifications. And then the checklist lists a lot of those uh, specifications there. Okay. All right, so those are the checklists, and that's just uh, a small accounting of some of the the questions that the auditor goes through uh, during the process, there are, there are many, many more questions than that. So the um, industry sterilization recalls and issues, we'll move on to that slide. So in the sterilization industry, a 483, a warning letter or a recall is considered a, a black, black eye for the company. And sterilization makes up over 22% of medical device recalls. So here I've just listed a couple of um, public 
uh, examples of regulatory noncompliances or nonconformances. One uh, firm initiated nonconformances for three instances of employee data manipulation and falsification. Uh, however, the firm failed to escalate this issue uh, of dosimetric data manipulation. Another one was your firm did not maintain documentation of written consent provided to your foreign contract manufacturers for the subcontracting of irradiation services for the conduct of the sterilization processing of your firm's land sets as required in your quality contract with the foreign contract manufacturers. So um, these audits are very critical, and this is just an example of uh, some of the the findings we can see uh, in our industry. So now on to the critical uh, technical process audits using subject matter experts. Uh, the, the benefits of the Metacred sterilization program. So the benefits of the program include consistency, standardization, Reduction in redundant audits, uh, that is so, so important because so many of the um, contractors, sterilization uh, contractors are conducting uh, audits or having audits conducted in their facility on a weekly basis. So the, the intent is to reduce those audits and then to have like-for-like -like, uh, consistency uh, where each supplier is upheld to the same standards, questions, and the same process. So also it becomes familiar. This leads into greater quality, uh, process discipline, operational efficiency, uh, continuous improvement, and lower cost. So the audit criteria, um, as Mark has mentioned, is developed by the industry and for the industry based on the, uh, the relevant AME ISO standards for our industry and for quality systems. The audit is conduct conducted by subject matter experts only. Um, also, this provides a greater visibility of the supply chain to all levels and sub-tiers and better flow down of OEM requirements. The subject matter expert conducted audits, I mean, this is a key part of this program. Um, an in-depth in critical audit, uh, process audit, that is compliant and consistent to accepted industry technical standards and conducted by subject matter experts in sterilization. So the audits are a very deep dive into the critical technical requirements of the sterilization standards. The auditors are chosen not as just quality generalists. They are also required to have many years of experience in the relevant sterilization modalities that are being audited. And also, they must understand auditing principles having uh, performed audits as well as part of their uh, background. <clears throat> now, the participating OEMs accept the audit criteria and participate in generating that criteria. Right, so now technical standards compliance. So each audit is being conducted to the same criteria, which removes or greatly decreases the variability through these checklists of defined requirements with the specific yes or no answer by the auditor as to meeting that requirement. The auditor is also required to demonstrate through a review of records and documentation the evidence of that compliance, if, if indeed they are compliant to the question. Then all audits are reviewed by the PRI, PRI Metacred staff engineer, and all audit, audits and nonconformances are reviewed by the task group comprised of highly skilled industry experts in the sterilization uh, space. And then finally, this is, um, shows the standards that uh, are 
that the checklists are based on for the base document <clears throat> quality systems based on ISO 13485 requirements and 21 CSR Part 820. The radiation checklist is based on the requirements from 11137 Part 1, uh, also 11137 Part 3, and then TIR 29. Ethylene oxide based on the requirements from 111.35, TIR 14, and then 10993 Part 7. And so now I will turn it over to Rod Parker. Well, thank, thanks, Kim uh, and Mark before you. Uh, as it says here, my name is Rod Parker. Uh, I've been uh, as my as my brief overview of an introduction had at the beginning, uh, I've been involved with both regulatory affairs and sterility for or toxicology in some way, shape, or form for the better part of the 40 years of my working life. So I can tell you that any attempt to standardize a process is a good thing. Uh, what I'm going to go through here quite briefly in finishing up on a lot of this is uh, some standardized accreditations and the benefit. Uh, we'll go through uh, some supply chain things and some non-conformities. Let me get my slide working. There we go. Uh, the, the accreditation program from the standpoint of being standardized, uh, I think the, the key word here is, is the, first slide, the first word on the slide is consistency. Having worked in this for a very, very long time and being one of the uh, individuals that have been assigned with training responsibilities of some of our subject matter experts, in auditing in this process, uh, anything that we can do consistent is always best for both the supplier and the OEM. Uh, that being said, uh, I think anyone who would be listening to this presentation would understand that everyone has the ability to be, uh, you know, interactive with their own type of, of flavor in auditing and, and their own uh, personality. But by using a standardized audit, uh, we remove a lot of that aspect from the avenues of, uh, I guess you'd say, personal bias. Uh, and this is an important thing in an auditing step. Uh, those that remember that, uh, you know, the, the old CGMPs underneath the FDA and, and in our notified bodies perspectives now, you know, we used to have a system called uh, critical processes of which the example used was always sterilization. Uh, this was primarily printed in the uh, preamble for the initial quality system regs, uh, where it took out the term actual critical processes and just genericized it into the term processes and process control. Uh, but this process control still includes the critical steps and it includes sterilization as one of them. So it, it is vastly important that these product or these uh, audits get done and get done on a repetitive basis to ensure that sterilization is a key component for product or product uh, sterility and patient safety are done correctly. Uh, many folks, and I believe some other even smaller or larger companies have gone to the fact of using many audit criteria uh, and very much concerned with the quality system regs, but uh, we don't always have the expertise associated with the sterilization dive perspective that Kim alluded to. So what this program does when it conducts these same criteria in the yes, no, NNA type format is it allows the auditor to express his or her, uh, you know, audit style at the audit, but doesn't allow them to interject it into the outcome. So it removes quite a bit of any of the variation from audit to audit or from supplier to supplier. Uh, so one audit can replace a lot of different steps in this and be more valid in comparing suppliers or comparing, uh, you know, audit from year to year. Uh, in the supply chain requirement aspect of this, the visibility of this from the standard process that we work with is underneath the, the way the audit is conducted on, an, uh, you know, an e-network or an internet network. Uh, where they're, con you know, they're conducted and stored in a program that allows the subscribers to have a permanent uh, record. That permanent record does, you know, comply with the regulations to be able to say your audit is there, but it also allows, uh, you know, subscribing members and OEMs to, to return to this record and see what their issues were 
uh, back and forth and, and to prep for either the next audit or to use as a tool for any type of process improvements they wish to do or, or in, uh, in prepping any of their other sites. If you're a site that has multiple sites, uh, it's one of these things that could be used as a training tool or, a, or a, uh, you know, a training or improvement tool as well. It also allows for a lot of the requirements to flow down to any of the sub-tier suppliers. So, you know, you have an in-depth look that directly stacks with the standards. Uh, so if there is a finding or a difference during the audit process, because this flows down to all of the areas uh, assigned to the checklist, it's easy to take that particular area and walk it down into all aspects of your process or your product's perspective. Uh, so one criteria against the standard, as the standards are written, should fit everything that should be available under those same questions in accordance to the standard. So, you know, all of these things put together should allow a very basic program to be run by both parties and to be able to use the outcomes of those parties uh, to better process any of the equipment coming through. So, what I've been tasked to do at the finish here is to show some of the audit outcomes that have come so far uh, during the generations of some of these audits. These are by no means to confer any, any harm or, or damage or anything to any particular supplier, but it's just to show a flavoring of the in-depth perspectives of what are done during the audit process. Uh, I think you'll notice in some of these uh, comments that uh, they are definitely based on a high technical expertise of the product itself, of the, of the process itself. Our first one, and we come into here on, on this is under the general quality checklist. I, I think you're getting used to the numbers of uh, AC8113, which is general, the general quality checklist. The first one here, you know, is a records uh, process where basically there was an, an, an engineering change uh, that, you know, affected a document for the change, but it wasn't identified. Uh, so you do go into documentation in depth uh, during this, and this is to answer an audit question. Uh, it may be a simple question that's yes or no, but it, it, the finding that comes out of it or the response that comes out of it, we quote the, uh, the actual statement where you find it in the standard and the, you know, the comment of what happened during the audit. The second one there is, is, is uh, a comment that that's a, a point of improvement that can show people how these processes can improve their given documentation they have currently. In other words, it, it had a risk assessment document that actions were taken. Well, there was a, a process where there was a high risk identified and virtually there was no action taken. Now, in this case, it could have been, not that, not that I would make any case that it was, but uh, it could have been a case where you know, the risk didn't happen. But in essence, the document for assessment said that it, it was high risk and there should be some action taken to alleviate a high risk. The next one flows through into handling items still under the general checklist. If the facility layout is such that a flow handles the materials control, uh, if places, if you know, parts are not put in the right place or if there's a process to control parts that aren't in the, in the correct place or back and forth, uh, in this case, there was a, a uh, you know, it may have been a single box uh, that could have been in a wrong place. The old adage is if you're a, a auditor and you find something that, that doesn't look right and you ask and, and it's, it's, it happens during one step, it may happen often. So that, that's why you have these findings. Uh, if the facility, you know, has the layout that it's handled in a certain way, uh, as number two there goes, and the procedure says, says that it's uh, it's done a certain way, but there are indications during a tour or during a walkthrough that, that are confusing or look a certain way, uh, you ask those questions. So in this case, you have one where uh, you have boxes that were stacked, double stacked and triple stacked, um, and a sign next to them that said, don't double stack, but they weren't necessarily associated with the products that were, in essence, triple and double stacked, but it leads to the fact of should there be a sign that says these are okay to be double or triple stacked. So basically those are the in-depth type of things that you would ask. Under a standard quality system audit walking through a facility, this may be something that a, a person not associated with Cerulean may or may not catch. 
Uh, these ones here, again, in the general audit is, uh, you know, if you have a lockout on a predefined uh, incorrect assets, you know, you have the systems that lock somebody out. Um, the issue in, in this day that, that it had a, a lack of the lockout for an individual access. Uh, that could be a, a prescribed uh, security issue if you want to look at that way. You also have the audit findings here, and I'm going to ask you to all the uh, people that are on this webinar or people that may see this later to keep in mind this, this particular one here under the paragraph for requirements of internal audits. It basically said they were done in 24 months and they're supposed to be done in 12, but keep that in mind because I'm going to address it in the next slide. When we go to the specific slides in some cases, this is under radiation. You can see that the discriminatory batch recalibration was done, but you know there wasn't any, any uh, given frequency uh, of the batch recalibration. So that in this case, the procedure said there was, and there wasn't one actually de designated. So that is something that calls not performance of procedures, and, and that is a, a, a process to be able to say it was not followed. The other one, the second one here is a UV light filter. Uh, where you use filters that, that weren't employed in the light fixtures where decimeters are used, uh, and, you know, and, as required. Uh, I would ask you to keep that one in mind too. And then the last one I'll just keep in, in mind is the verification of process parameters were met. Uh, you know, the model and the serial number didn't match. In other words, this is record keeping 101 and the fact that the numbers on the record and the numbers on the machine didn't match. Now I ask you to keep in mind one in the previous slide uh, about auditing and the one in the second slide having to do with UV filters, having a all-inclusive owner-based or industry-based and, and all-inclusive task force allows us to improve the checklist as we go along. Uh, in these two cases that we were talking about, just to lay, lay uh, fears alongside, is, is there, were, there were some contentions on, on whether these were actual requirements under the standard. Uh, there was a discussion held with the task force, and we've improved our checklist from that point. Uh, and this happens, uh, can happen frequently in the audit if there's a contention to that the standard is not applied correctly. Uh, but that is, in this process, is not left up to the individual auditor to make that decision on the fly at the facility. It's, it's made up to bring back to the system to see if the OEMs or the, or the supplier-based people want to agree as to what is the output or intent of the standard, and it goes from there, which allows the system to be very impactful in how it's addressed, uh, to, you know, to the, to the furtherment or betterment of the auditing process. And then the last one we, we do take on to things for uh, ethylene oxide processing issues, we have one where it was stored in accordance to the vendor specification. I think that's one exactly that Kim alluded to uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, and it basically states that it has to be stored at less than 30 C. However, the storage, you know, that we, we found was an outside in a ventilated area and wasn't temperature controlled. So, you know, even in this case, the temperature might not have been at 30 C, uh, which is quite hot. Uh, but the, the just of the fact is that it's supposed to be in a controlled environment and it wasn't measured, so no one would really know. Uh, that could affect a lot of different things. The second one there is again the correct type and number of, of a number of runs uh, that were in the current thing is, is airflow was in the chamber was not assessed. So I think this gives you a pretty good uh, pretty good adoption or a pretty good indication into some of the questions uh, and there are many 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 questions but these are just some of the outcomes of some of the questions that were answered negatively during some of the audits that we've performed. And just to give you a flavor of the fact that they are in-depth, they're very in-depth, they go into all the aspects of the processing of the contract sterilizer in all the venues that we've had and the modalities that we have uh, that the contract suppliers or sterility suppliers would, would be able to give us. Uh, there's a lot of interaction between that uh, process and the task force uh, and the fact that it's industry-based allows those of us in the industry to be able to you know, use these types of audits to improve both of our, our given information we supply to the sterilization provider and allows the sterilization provider to improve processes according to what is required as seen from the OEM. And it does it in a consistent manner in which they're not getting different requests from different suppliers or there's no 
indication as to how big or small a, uh, you know, a supplier to this uh, contract sterilizer is, it, it's the same audit, it's the same process, and it's consistent over time. Uh, that ends mine. Uh, I'll turn it back over to anybody for uh, questions. Courtney? Great. Thank you so much. We will now begin the Q&A session. If you have a question, please feel free to submit it using the Q&A panel located at the bottom right of your screen. After typing your questions in the space at the bottom, hit the Send button. Please be sure to direct your questions to all panelists in the Ask menu. Your questions will not be seen by other members of the audience. So we had a few that kind of came in through the, through the presentation here. Um, I think a good one to start us off would be if you could outline what you think the benefits of the program are to, to the contract sterilization provider. Sure. Uh, this is Rod. I mean, I can, I can grasp that one. I mean, I think, I think in, our, in our slide deck that we have here, I mean, the, the ones that are consistent uh, over and over in the slides is that it should reduce the amount of repetitive quality system audits that that uh, you know, so, uh, the, the contractor of the contract sterilization process should do. If, uh, and I know many of them that, that may be on this uh, webinar or are available to see this or, or are contacted by others would understand the fact that they are inundated with audits. Uh, I know from my own personal perspective that I, I've actually audited the same plant numerous times in numerous years. And unfortunately, in my same company, I've had other divisions audit the same plant in the same years, uh, this takes time at the contract sterilizer, and that contract sterilizer can save time by being certified under an audit that that OEM will now recognize and can cut down on the numbers of people that show up to audit them you know, on any, any annual basis uh, under these, this program. It also, as we would reiterate again, it, it, it allows consistency so that they don't get different questions or different audit formats from different suppliers. Um, that happens consistently. And then again, it allows for documentation of this compliance through a certification. So if you were a, a contract supplier uh, and you wanted to show that, that you have a good system, uh, you know, having an ability to say that you're a certified supplier under a program uh, may allow new customers who know nothing about you to be able to say that you've gone through some type of pre-audit or, or, or pre-kind of check that would tell you that you're a, a good bet for them to know that you're doing the proper process. I hope that answers the question. Uh, yeah, I think that's great. So likewise then, what about benefits for the OEM that is requiring, you know, contracting out their sterilization processes or services rather? Well, just, just as follow-up for that perspective, um, you know, the opposite reverts back to the OEMs. In other words, the OEMs, uh, uh, those of us that are larger that have multiple divisions uh, will be, would be able to look to one source for an audit and not have to worry about keeping those resources in-house all the time at each facility uh, in order to comply with that audit perspective. Uh, the other thing, again, if I was looking, for, if I was a OEM looking for a new supplier and I have a a documented or a, or a certif certification type of process that I can look into, um, it also allows me to be able to say that I have a, a better assurance that that supplier is a, a good provider of this system as based on, on an independent industry-based audit. Uh, and again, it, it, it's a virtual cost savings from the perspective that uh, I'm, I'm not doing a lot of trial and error in finding to, trying to find the right supplier for my product uh, I, I actually have some pre-knowledge uh, that I can work into them, and, and if I have them already on my books, uh, I'm able to rely on this audit and, and not have to worry about repetitively keeping up with, uh, with whether these audits have been done and maintained since the system will do that for me uh, if the certification is maintained. I hope that is right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so here's, I got a pretty technical one that, that came in, so bear with me, and I understand if you guys want to try to take a stab at this offline, but if you can, I want to, you know, do the asker justice by, um, by reading it. So, can an existing validation be used if the same product is packaged in a less densely packaged configuration using the same sterilization cycle, 
of a higher density package process. <laughs> wow. Well, I know. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I don't know, if Kim, if you want that. I, I can give my two cents on that one. I mean, I understand the question, um, and it would depend on the modality. I'm, I'm believing that's probably a radiation question. Um, but the, the true answer to that is the fact that what this audit does is provide the quality system and technical aspects of the product. Uh, when you actually do a product perspective or product validation perspective, that unfortunately ends up being the responsibility of the vendor to know whether the product density and applied dose is correct. Uh, what this audit can do, though, is if they're worried about whether the supplier is applying the correct dose, uh, they, can, they can be found that this supplier has systems and procedures in place to monitor and supply the correct dose. So what they would be able to do is ask the, the contractor for you know, their documentation showing that they applied that dose and then that, uh, that vendor would be, or that uh, OEM would be confident that, that that dose was applied. But as far as what the dose or the process would be, unfortunately that still rests with the, uh, the sterilization experts at the particular company. Yeah, I agree with that uh, assessment. And it's very specific to the product, the type of product, what it is, the difference in density uh, as to how that that would be resolved, but uh, that's something that had, would have to um, to be involved with the, the OEM. I, I, I might add on that, Corey, just just a, as a caveat for that. If the question was, will the pro, you know, if the question alluded to the fact of whether the same validation process um, could be could be available to a different product under a under a similar validation. Um, it's, if the process is the question and they want to know if the process is audited correctly, then this could help them in making that definition. Okay. Thank you. I mean, thanks for even understanding the question. That's way over my head. So that's why we have the experts on. But all right, I think that's all the questions that we have. So thank you so much, Mark, Kim, and Rod. I know this is such a um, critical, critical process in the medical device industry, so we really appreciate you experts weighing in. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.